architecture. Essentially, we have an import interface for our labs who will be using this around the country. And again, you are agnostic of your genotyping um, platform. And so the idea is that irrespective of the system you're using, it is then standardized using the data standards, which I'll come on to in one second. And one of the power, uh, the, the, the power of this approach is that you have this content management environment, which means that you get consistency in theory across the NHS. If you try to do bespoke implementations in each electronic healthcare record or in each region, you have the issue where you might get um, variation in clinical guidance with some systems using guidance from CPIC, some systems using guidance from the DPWG. So this ensures a single source of guidance within the NHS, it ensures that quality control, and it means that we can curate that guidance over time as the evidence updates. And so, as I say, we're not just standardizing that genomic data, but we're standardizing that, those clinical recommendations as well. And so our feeling is that that should be hosted by organizations like the BPS with that quality control process in place. And so to finish, I want to talk a little bit about some superb work that's been done uh, by members of our team looking at developing these data standards. And there's been a, a huge amount of work that's gone in there with uh, a, a company called Fresh Air who supported us to develop this uh, open air archetype, and that will be published very soon. But essentially, at the heart of uh, this data standard is disaggregating the, the pharmacogenetic test that you have from your pharmacogenetic profile. And what I mean by that is a patient might present and you want to do CYP2C19 genotyping, and they, at first, have what's called a TACMAN assay. So you're just looking at two variants in uh, CYP2C19, and you find their wild type. They don't carry any of those variants. So within their profile, they're a normal metabolizer. They're star one, star one. But for whatever reason, in a, in a few years' time, they might end up having a panel-based pharmacogenetic test, which actually tests for far more variants. So the Agena assay, for example, tests for a large number of variants in CYP2C19. As the discussion before, some have higher levels of evidence than others. But this may find that they actually carry a star four variant. And so based on the way that we have separated the testing uh, standardization from the profile, your profile gets updated, and this individual is an intermediate metabolizer. And that's been a very powerful approach to allow us to think about how your pharmacogenetic profile might grow and develop over time as we expect it to as uh, genetic testing becomes increasingly ubiquitous. And because you're doing panel testing, you might have lots of other variants as well. So we really think that this is a model for integrating genomics in routine practice. Pharmacogenetics is an obvious example, but increasingly, if you're thinking about polygenic risk scoring, you need a way to get that into clinical practice. And so working with partners like Genomics England, we focus very much on genotyping at the moment, but you could theoretically use next generation sequence data uh, as well. Um, and so in the future, we hope to collect that routinely collected healthcare data from the EHR. And if you do have these rare variants, let's say, and that you're not entirely sure what they might mean in some of these pharmacogenes, you might be able to start seeing signals within these data sets. So you have this iterative learning system. And then we know from our work, patients want to see their results as well. So there needs to be a lot of work in that space. So just to finish, overarching principles that we always think about. Um, pharmacogenomics is not rare disease or cancer. We have a great genomic medicine service. We can learn a lot from what's been done already. But if we try to apply the same principles that we do in rare disease or cancer, implementation will just not work. The people using the data, how the data is used is just fundamentally different. And pharmacogenomics is not special. It is not a panacea. It is part of an overall um, healthcare system. And it is just one variable that can be used to inform prescribing. So we shouldn't take this kind of exceptionalist viewpoint and this very deterministic viewpoint of pharmacogenetics. So thank you very much. I'd like to thank all uh, of our team and very grateful to my funders as well. So thank you. So thank you very much, John. Um, so some, again, some more exciting work for us to, to follow um, as it progresses. I think we're a little bit tight for question time. Will you be around at, at lunchtime if anybody wants to ask any questions, unless there's a really burning question that anybody wants to ask right now? Okay, so please do find John at lunchtime, and we'll move on to um, our last speaker, um, which is Dr. Julia Carrasco-Zanini-Sanchez.
Um, Julia is a postdoctoral researcher in computational genomics and multiomics at Queen Mary's new Precision Healthcare University Research Institute. And she's going to talk to us about plasma proteomics for screening and prediction of diverse diseases. Hi, so first of all, thank you for this uh, invitation. And I'm gonna be talking about something a little bit different today. So I'm gonna go back to some of the points made earlier today uh, around how are we using novel technologies to identify people who are at high risk of developing diseases. So if we uh, look at uh, how information flows from the genome to the phenome, we see how proteins really sit at the heart of it. Um, they are the, center, the, the main molecules um, or the main effector molecules on cellular function. And as such, they actually capture both information on genetic predisposition and lifestyle and other environmental influences. Um, they're also actually the largest class of pharmaceutical drug targets and FDA-approved lab tests. So for all of these reasons, uh, studying proteins really provides unique opportunities to identify novel biomarkers um, as well as informing etiological mechanisms involved in disease development. However, it is only until relatively recently that we can do this at scale. Um, so historically, measuring the circulating proteome has been challenging due to the massive uh, difference in concentration of proteins that are found in blood. Um, so it is only until relatively recently that the techniques that we can use to measure this have achieved a balance between specificity and throughput. So nowadays, these techniques are broadly divided into two. Uh, the first class is those that are based on mass spectrometry, and the second class are those that are based on affinity reagents. Um, so I'm not going to go into detail to all of this, but I'm going to focus on this uh, technique that I'm highlighting in the center, which is a technique that is implemented by Olink, which is called the proximity extension assay that essentially relies on recognizing their target protein by two separate antibodies that are linked to complementary oligonucleotides. Um, so we embarked on an ambitious project, which was a collaboration between industry and academia, to answer the question on whether we can leverage uh, broad capture plasma proteomics technologies to identify people who are at very high risk of developing a range of diseases in the future. And to address this question, uh, the UK Biobank study is uniquely well suited for two main reasons. The first one is that uh, thanks to the pharma proteomics project, there are now uh, plasma protein measurements for around uh, almost 3,000 proteins uh, that were done at the baseline study visit or taken from samples at the baseline study visit. Um, and the second reason is that all of these participants are linked to electronic health records. And this is massively important because then this allows us to develop refined disease definitions um, across a range of different clinical specialties. And this is really the tremendous work that some of our colleagues from UCL have been doing. So previously they had developed a phenotyping algorithm to define 308 different physical and mental conditions. And the work that our colleagues from GSK did was basically to apply this phenotyping algorithm into UK Biobank uh, to uh, derive these disease definitions. And for the study, we retained um, 218 of those disease of diseases for which we had at least 80 incident cases um, within 10 years of follow-up after the baseline study visit. So what we did was uh, we took all of the participants from the UKB uh, PPP random subcohort, um, and we excluded uh, those people who had uh, prevalent status for the disease under study. Uh, we then took all of these individuals and divided them into a training and validation set. Uh, the training set essentially was to be able to derive um, informative proteins to be able to predict the incidence of this disease by using uh, a feature selection strategy that relies on running lasso regression over multiple iterations. And essentially what this allows us to do is to generate a ranking which will tell us which proteins are most informative to be able to predict the incidence of disease. Uh, once we identify the top predictor proteins, we can then optimize a model and finally test its performance. Um, but it's always really important to think about what we're gonna benchmark these novel technologies against. So of course we can start thinking about common and standard risk factors. So in first instance, we benchmarked our protein model against the clinical model that included uh, standard risk factors such as age, sex, BMI, ethnicity, smoking status, alcohol consumption, and family history. Um, but this is actually a relatively weak benchmark as we know that there's already some blood tests that are used for uh, 
as, as diagnostic tests or screening tests. So the real beauty about UK Biobank is that there was information on 37 clinical biomarkers um, that are standardly used in clinical practice. So on second instance, we also benchmarked our protein signatures against uh, standard clinical biomarker signatures. So um, the first thing to highlight is that when we add uh, the top 5 to 20 informative proteins onto the clinical benchmark, uh, we improve the prediction for 67 diverse diseases across a range of clinical specialties. So this is what you can see in this figure where the black dots represent the clinical benchmark model and the colored dots represent uh, the, the performance of the model when we add uh, our proteins. Um, and as you can see, some of the improvements range from rather small improvements in around 2% to uh, some really striking improvements in over 30% in the, in the concordance index. Um, and we wanted to quantify this, not only in terms of concordance index, but actually using uh, metrics that may be perhaps a bit more intuitive when we want to think about this in terms of screening. So uh, what I'm showing you in the first plot here on the left, on the right for you, uh, are the detection rates at a 10% false positive rate in the x-axis for the clinical benchmark and in the y-axis when we add the proteins. Um, and as you can see, for all of the 67 diseases, we see a better detection rates with our proteomic risk scores. Um, and on this second plot, actually, you can see it a little bit better. Here I'm showing you the likelihood ratios in gray, the benchmark, the clinical benchmark, and in orange uh, when we add the protein models. And for those of you who are not familiar with uh, likelihood ratios, um, if we take, for example, celiac disease, which is at the top here where we have a likelihood ratio of 8, what this means is essentially that um, people who have a positive test or a high proteomic risk are um, at least eight times more likely to develop celiac disease within the next 10 years of follow-up compared to people who test uh, negative or with a low proteomic risk. And one of the things that I always like to highlight in this slide is the example for prostate cancer for which our proteomic signature included PSA, so prostate-specific antigen, which is a biomarker that has actually been already started to be tested in, in clinical trials. So one thing that is really encouraging to see is how for a lot of diseases, the likelihood ratios that were achieved by our protein signatures were comparable or even higher uh, to this example where there's already evidence of, uh, of clinical implementation. Um, but one thing that's always really important to consider as well is uh, how we want to implement this and the target population that we want to screen with this test. So in this diagram, what I'm trying to represent is two different scenarios. Uh, the first one is the scenario where we think that we want to screen uh, everyone with these proteomic tests. And again, I'm using here celiac disease as an example uh, where we know that uh, around one person in 100 people will actually develop celiac disease. Uh, but the second scenario on the right is where we think that we actually want to apply these sorts of uh, novel tests to a population in which we already know uh, that there is an, abs uh, that an increased absolute risk for developing uh, celiac disease. So in this case, this could represent, for example, other people with autoimmune conditions, where we know that about 1 in 18 individuals of these uh, people with autoimmune conditions will be diagnosed with celiac disease. And uh, as you can see here in the diagram, this immediately translates into a greater benefit of applying these tests. And essentially what this means is that once we apply the test and we have a positive result, we are much more uh, certain that this person will actually go on to develop uh, celiac disease in this case. Um, and again, the UK Biobank is a fantastic resource. Um, it's unique in its breadth and scale. Uh, so there's very few other studies with this kind of uh, depth of molecular information. Um, so validating these results externally is a challenge, but fortunately we had done a study in the uh, Epic Norfolk cohort uh, where we did proteomics on baseline samples um, on participants that had been follow up over time. And here we were able to validate uh, a, a few of our proteomic risk scores that we developed in the UK Biobank in Epic Norfolk. And this is exactly what I'm showing you in this figure. So in the x-axis here you can see the C index that we achieved in UK Biobank and in the y-axis, you can see the external validation in Epic Norfolk. Um, and as you can see, uh, for most of our models, uh, the validation showed uh, very concordant results, both in terms of the absolute C index, but also in terms of the uh, increment of the, uh, of the C index when we add the proteins on top of the clinical benchmark. Uh, but again, going to UK, back to UK Biobank, um, as I mentioned, taking this clinical benchmark is a, is a relatively uh, kind of weak comparison, 
So the next step that we did was to compare the performance of our protein models against uh, clinical biomarkers. And here again, this is the same uh, type of representation where I'm showing you the detection rates uh, for the uh, biomarker benchmark and then the, uh, the novel kind of protein signatures. And again, here on the right, the same, but represented with the likelihood ratios. So I'm gonna focus on this figure because it's a lot clearer to see. Um, in the bottom here, we have a range of diseases for which actually the clinical biomarkers do perform better than the, than the protein signatures. So these are the ones where the uh, blue dots are, are uh, kind of higher than the, the orange dots, which are the protein signatures. And these are actually positive, uh, like positive controls because we include diagnostic tests amongst these biomarker signatures. So for example, we have diabetes, where we use uh, glucose and HbA1c as diagnostic tests. We have gout, for which our biomarker signature included uric acid and so on. Um, but as you can see, for the vast majority of the other diseases, the protein models um, outperformed the clinical biomarkers. And um, one of the questions that we always get is, well, what are these protein signatures uh, representing? So I'm going to take one of the most striking examples that we got from our uh, protein predictive signatures, which was the one for multiple myeloma, uh, which is, as you can see here on the top, uh, outperformed the clinical benchmark and the biomarker uh, benchmark across a range of different false positive rates. Um, and this signature was composed by uh, five different proteins, which we were able to follow up uh, through a collaboration with Professor Simon Haas. Um, so Professor Simon Haas had done single cell RNA sequencing in newly diagnosed individuals with multiple myeloma. Um, and here in the bottom, you can see basically the UMAP representation of this single cell RNA sequencing. And I'm gonna focus here on the plasma cells, which are the relevant tissue in the pathology of uh, multiple myeloma. And as you can see on the plot here on the right, you can see that four out of the five predictive proteins for multiple myeloma were very specifically expressed in, in plasma cells. Um, and actually, uh, when we quantified the expression in healthy cells versus malignant cells, we saw that there was an increase in the expression of two of these proteins that was being driven by malignant cells. So highlighting how um, these approaches can also point to the underlying biology of some of these diseases. Um, and finally, again, one of the real beauties about UK Biobank and having linkage to electronic health records is that we can do um, a, a very important assessment of whether these predictive biomarkers are specific for one disease or are predictive across a range of many different diseases. So this is precisely what we did uh, across the 501 proteins that were involved in the 67 predictive signatures uh, that improved uh, over the clinical benchmark. And we saw that for 147 of these proteins, um, these were predictive across more than one disease. Um, and what is striking to see is that they were not only predictive across more than one disease, but often it was across more than one clinical specialty. Um, so here kind of just highlighting some of the top candidates that uh, perhaps actually point to more general markers of uh, multimorbidity. So just to finalize, um, I've basically shown some initial work on how we've been using some novel technologies, in this case plasma proteomics, for prediction of incident diseases, um, and how doing this uh, systematically across many different diseases can then point to either disease-specific biomarkers or more general markers of multimorbidity. Um, and of course, again, as I mentioned, UK Biobank is a tremendous resource, but there's really a lot of work to do um, ahead to kind of translate these findings into potential clinical applications. Um, so, you know, just a few points. Obviously, UK Biobank, although they do have uh, standard clinical biomarkers, uh, further benchmarking with very specific disease biomarkers, for example, uh, the M protein for multiple myeloma really needs to be done to understand the potential of uh, translation of these signatures. Um, and a very important point is, of course, as has been mentioned earlier in some of the talks, um, we need to really leverage the diversity of cohorts uh, that we have in, in the UK and other countries to test the generalizability of these findings, um, specifically in, in ethnically diverse populations. Uh, so with that, I just want to thank uh, the, very, uh, number, the very wide number of people that were involved in this project. As you can see, this was a tremendous collaboration between uh, academia and industry. Um, and with that, I just want to finish off saying thank you. Thank you very much to you. That was really, really interesting. Uh, another area to, to track the development of. Does anybody have a quick question before...
I wrap up and we break for lunch. So we've just got one over there. Thank you, great talk. I was wondering how likely we can use the proteins to predict the celiac disease in reality. What's the main challenge? Thank you. Yeah, I mean, celiac disease is actually one of those examples that there's like very good um, blood tests already clinically implemented. So I, I showed it here for illustration purposes um, as it's kind of an intuitive example, but in reality, celiac disease is probably one of the examples for which um, you know, further benchmarking against the clinical tests that are already being used would, would be really necessary to understand that. Okay, thank you. Okay, right, so um, we're only a couple of minutes over now, so um, I hope you enjoyed all of those talks. I thought they were really interesting. Um, I think all the speakers are around at lunchtime if you want to ask them any follow-up questions. Um, we have a reasonable break now, I think back at half past one. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. I hope you enjoyed the, the lunch and had some useful discussions. So we're now moving on to session three, which is about Mendelian randomization. Uh, this is really an up-and-coming subject, though it's uh, been around for quite a while at this stage. Today, uh, we have three speakers from London. Um, for various reasons, uh, we were able to invite three speakers from London, but I, I would like to point out that Mendelian randomization research is going on at a number of UK centres. It's not entirely uh, London-based. So our first speaker is uh, Dr. Verena Zuber, and uh, uh, Verena is from Imperial College and is going to talk to us about Mendelian randomization and strengths and limitations. So this is a good introductory topic. Exactly, so first of all, welcome everyone and thanks so much for the invitation here. So my name is Verena Zuber and I'm a senior lecturer at the Department of Epidemiology and Biostatistics at Imperial College. I've been working on methods development for MR since uh, roughly seven years. And in this presentation, I'm first going to give you a conceptual introduction into Mendelian randomization, or short MR. And as said, the talk is titled, What Can We Learn From Genetic Evidence and Where Does It Fail? And everything here boils down to the so-called small print of MR. These are the instrumental variable assumptions. So I'm going to spend quite a bit of time in my talk to take you through those assumptions, and I'm going to show you where it goes wrong and where it works. And then I'm going to give you a short conclusion and on future directions. So first, the main goal in epidemiology is to estimate the effect of an exposure X on an outcome Y. The problem here comes in, or the challenge that we are facing, is we need to account for confounding factors. So confounder is essentially a cause of both X and Y. And most of the time, these confounders are unobserved. We are not able to measure them. We don't even know what they may be. And what MR essentially does, it uses genetic variants or SNPs G as instrumental variables to infer the effect of X on Y. So why we can do this? Our genotype is assigned randomly when passed from parents to offspring at meiosis. Also, it's important to note that it's fixed at conception and reminds constant throughout life. So we don't have reverse causation. And we can see MR as a quasi-experimental approach. So we exploit your naturally occurring randomization in the transmission of genetic variants. And because of this, MR is often seen as an analogy to a randomized trial. So you can see this illustrated here in this graph, where on the left we have illustrated a randomized trial. On the right, we have Mendelian randomization. So we start off uh, with, in randomized trial, we start off with our sample. We do a randomization by design, where we assign part of our sample to the placebo arm, the other part to the drug arm. In the placebo arm, we would assume that we have normal cholesterol levels and normal rates of cardiovascular events, for example. In contrast, in the intervention arm, we do give a drug that will lower the LDL cholesterol level, and what we're hoping to find is a lower rate of cardiovascular events. In contrast, in MR, we start off with our population. We have a random allocation of alleles at meiosis, and we know there are certain genotypes that are associated with 
our exposure of interest, which is cholesterol. So we have here a random allocation to either genotype A or genotype B. We know that partic um, uh, individuals with genotype B have normal LDL cholesterol levels. We would expect a normal rate of cardiovascular events. In contrast, participants that carry the genotype A, they have lower LDL cholesterol levels and hopefully lower rate of cardiovascular events. As I mentioned before, in MR, everything rests on a small print. What are our instrumental variable assumptions? You see them all encoded here in this directed acyclic graph. We have our exposure X, our outcome Y. We have here the genetic variants that we want to use as instruments. So the first assumption is the relevance assumption. All this means is that the genetic variant is predicting the exposure X, so that we have an arrow going here from G to X. Second assumption is the exchangeability assumption that essentially states that there's no arrow connecting G and U, so that the variant is independent of the confounder's view of the exposure outcome association. And the final assumption is the exclusion restriction assumption that says that the variant is independent of the outcome Y, conditional on the exposure X and U. So there's no other pathway connecting G to Y than via X. So I wanted to give you now a couple of other examples how the instrumental variable design has been used in other disciplines. I'm going to start off with the Vietnam draft lottery that was done in the 60s by Richard Nixon and he introduced a new lottery that decided who will be drafted to the army and who not. And the randomization worked in the following way. So we have 366 days of the year, including February 29. They were printed on small slips of papers and there was a random draw of birth dates. For example, the first date that was drawn was September 14. That meant that all eligible men that were born on September 14 were drafted to the army. So now uh, what Angris did in the 90s, he was interested in the effect of serving in the army on earnings later in life. And you see exactly how this is an instrumental variable design. We have here our lottery event that decided or predicts quite nicely who's going to serve the army. And this here is our outcome. Since this was a randomized event, we assume that um, the lottery event is independent of the confounders, and there's no other way how the lottery event impacts lifetime earnings than via the exposure serving the army. And we can also see randomized trials as a type of instrumental variable design, where our randomization predicts rather nicely which type of treatment an individual will receive in the end. And then um, this, the randomization in itself should not impact the clinical endpoint in another way than via the treatments that the person receives. And also, since it's a randomization, it should be independent of the confounder's view. So in recent years, there has been quite a bit of hype about Mendelian randomization. So Nature a news article called it in 2019, the gene-based hack that is revolutionizing epidemiology. But we see already here in the subtitle, there's a small warning, but are scientists overusing it? And here you can see this is the number of PubMed citations on MR where we have here the date. And you can see that this kind of exponential increase in MR publication. And the question here really is, when does an MR work, but when, where does it fail? And everything here boils down on the instrumental variable assumptions. So I'm going to go into these assumptions now in more detail. And the first one is the relevant assumption that just states that the genetic variant is associated with your exposure of interest. And here we need to um, first have a closer idea of what is the exposure that we want to actually look at. So the first um, type of um, MR study are polygenic exposures, where we have many genetic variants associated genome-wide. And typical examples here could be cardiovascular disease risk factors, think of obesity, cholesterol, blood pressure. Or we could also look at lifestyle factors, for example, smoking, alcohol consumption, physical activity, or education. And here what we have is we have many genetic variants are available as instruments where each of those genetic variants only explains a small fraction of the variance in the exposure. At the same time, we may have lots of heterogeneity because not all of those genetic variants will act via the same pathway. 
If you think of a complex trait like obesity, there are many ways how genetic variants can impact obesity. This may be either via fat metabolism, what you eat, how you exercise. Um, it's, there are many ways of how genetics actually impact these complex global phenotypes. And then they're also connected to this potential issues in the interpretability of the findings and how you would translate these into actual interventions. The second type of MR study we would call monogenic exposure, where we have a very defined specific genomic region. An example for this are molecular exposures and also drug target MR. So here we have a very strong biological motivation, yet at the same time we have only one or a few genetic variants as our instruments, but at the same time these may be very strong instruments because the genetics is very close to the phenotype that we're interested in. So here is just a short note on drug target MR. So the second talk in the session will go more into detail into drug target MR. So just a few words. So drug target MR uses genetic variants in a defined genomic region as proxies for an intervention on the proposed drug target, but it requires lots of domain knowledge on how the drug works. So you need to know which genomic region to look at, what is the molecular environment, and also what is the causal agent. So in recent years, there has been quite a type of lazy approach to drug target MR. And here I'm only citing um, the note of caution that is calling out this type of um, implementation of drug target MR. So in UK Biobank, we, fin we find the information which drugs individuals are taking. And no one is stopping you from running a GVAS on drug intake. But the answers we can get from this are quite um, disturbing. So here you see um, an MR study of calcium channel blockers on the risk of stroke and coronary artery disease. If we model this by drug intake behavior, we see that calcium channel blockers would increase the risk of stroke or increase the risk of coronary artery disease. And the issue here is why people are taking calcium channel blockers, very likely they have already high blood pressure or they're at a high risk because of family history or personal circumstances of stroke or coronary artery disease. If we do drug target MR in a proper and rigorous way, we indeed are able to pick up the protective effect of calcium channel blockers on stroke and coronary artery disease, which is pretty much in line with the clinical trial. A second example where MR can go wrong is the impact of air pollutants on health um, health traits and phenotypes. Just because we, can, we know the residential address of an individual in UK Biobank, we can link this to the um, annual average air pollutants for those individuals. It does not mean that genetic variants associated with this exposure have actual some biological possibility and also the corresponding findings then are very likely to be um, spurious. The second assumption, the exchangeability assumption, is something that we have often been, especially in early years, just waving about and saying, this is untestable, we don't know if this actual ho actually holds. In recent years, there have been quite a few examples where we actually think there has been violations of this assumption, and most of this boils down to selection bias. So when does selection bias become an issue? So this is an issue we have here now, a selection event that decides which participants are part of our study. And in particular, when the exposure causes the selection or the outcome causes the selection, then the selection event is something which we call a collider. And a collider just means that we have here a common cause of G and U. So we have here X, you see here the two arrows colliding, and then also the, um, your S as the cause of X would be a collider in this case. So where can selection bias happen? Uh, so if we have selection of study participants by study design, for example, we may use case control data for our exposure data, and Mike is going to bring up in the third session of, um, in the third talk of the session, some examples of these type of biases when you use case control study design. Other examples include disease progression or survival as outcome, where we can only study survival if an individual already has gotten the disease. 
And another example I'm going to show you in more detail now is survivor bias. So let's think of an example where we're going to look into blood pressure as a risk factor for dementia. The problem we're facing here, blood pressure is an exposure typically present in mid to late life, yet the average age of the first heart attack is, is around 65, while the average age of onset of dementia is in the 80s. So the problem that we're facing here is if we ran a naive MR, so basically blood pressure would first cause coronary artery disease before individuals can develop dementia. But yet, what is the direct effect of blood pressure on dementia? And now, when we run a naive univariable MR study, just looking at blood pressure and Alzheimer's disease, what we see indeed is a protective effect of blood pressure on Alzheimer's disease, which has been published in quite a few studies, and there is also biological background why this may be true. But when we started to look in more detail, we are seeing similar effects for things like smoking, obesity. And what we really think here, we have here some type of survival bias where as soon as we adjust for genetic liability to coronary artery disease, this protective effect attenuates towards the null. Now, coming to the third um, assumption, the exclusion restriction assumption, this is also known as the no pleiotropy assumption. So we essentially assume here that there's no other pathway A that connects G to Y that doesn't go via X. At the same time, I'm arguing that measured pleiotropy gives us a big opportunity to draw a more realistic picture of reality. And the model that we're using here is the multivariable MR model, where we include more than one exposure into our model. So this was initially devised to account for measured pleiotropy, but soon researchers were finding out that this gives us the opportunity to identify causal exposures or likely causal exposures from a set of candidate exposures. It's important to note here that we measure here the direct effect. So basically, what is the direct effect of X1 while on Y, and which is not mediated by any other of the exposures in, included in the model. So here you have a mediation scenario where the total effect would be the direct effect plus the mediated part here in blue. I'm now going to show you three extensions of multivariable MR that my group has been working on in the last years. The first one is MRBMA, which performs exposure selection. And here the gap in the literature is that the existing multivariable MR models are only able to model very few exposure, and few means two to three, maybe four if you're lucky. And yet we have as an opportunity the availability of high throughput data linked to genetics. So we have now lots of metabolomics data, proteomics data, and the questions that we had here is, are we able to put a lot of data into a statistical model and then let us tell us what are the most likely causes of disease? And the methods we use here are feature selection using Bayesian model averaging in order to model the uncertainty in the model selection. And here I'm not talking about the methods in itself, I'm just going to show you the application examples. The first question that we were trying to tackle is uh, what are key lipid characteristics that increase risk for coronary and peripheral artery disease in future just cut and put. So we know that key prevention strategies is to lower cholesterol, yet we don't know exactly the molecular mechanism, mechanisms. So the research question is can we pinpoint specific lipid traits as likely causes for cut and put? And also we want to know, are these mechanisms shared or distinct? So this illustrates our study design. So we have here the five major uh, lipoprotein traits. We take the genetic associations from UK Biobank. We have implemented this in a three sample MR design where we select our instruments based on an external data set from the Global Lipid Genetic Consortium. And we have here our outcome, in this case, PAT. So this here is the first set of results where you see on top the results for PAT, on the bottom for CUT. Uh, we are in a Bayesian framework, so we work with marginal inclusion probabilities and we also have a way of calling empirical p-values based on a permutation procedure and we adjust for multiple testing. What you see quite obviously here is we have apolipoprotein B as the top exposure uh, prioritized for both PAT and CUT. And 
less evidence for the other lipid traits. So this was quite interesting. So we thought we dig deeper into this finding by looking at the size of ARPO lipoprotein B containing particles. So we take this data from an NMR metabolite platform. And now we're looking at the, which sizes are prioritized. And we see here we have different sizes coming up for PAT and CAT, which could explain why we develop the disease in a different parts of our body. So yet at the same time, all we were able to do at this point was we were fitting two different MR models and then we were just eyeballing, do we pick up the same thing or not? And this motivated uh, the next model, the multivariable multi-response MR model, uh, where we are trying to account for residual correlation between the outcomes, which is not explained by the exposure. So we can put now many outcomes into the model and also model the connection between them. Also, this allows us to select shared causes of disease. Our motivation here is multimorbidity, which is defined as the simultaneous presence for two or more chronic health conditions in an individual. And we know from empirical evidence that there's a systematic co-occurrence of disease clusters and trajectories. So this uh, circle plot is based on electronic health records. We have here as an index condition, for example, heart failure. And you see here in the circle plot which other conditions are present in individuals with heart failure. So the open question that we need to address here, what causes certain disease clusters? Is this a random co-occurrence of seemingly unrelated individual health conditions without a common cause, or are there shared causal exposures underpinning multiple diseases? The methodological challenges here are can, how can we distinguish between distinct and shared causes, and how can we identify if an exposure directly affects an outcome or if it's mediated either via other exposure or other outcomes? And we have several opportunities here. For one, if we, we can define interventions with co-benefits that are affecting more than one outcome at the same time, and we can um, implement a shift from a disease to a patient-centric approach. So we were extending our initial application example and including more cardiovascular disease, CVD conditions. We included heart failure, cardioembolic stroke, atrial fibrillation. And as risk factors, we were turning to the NHS webpage and, and trying to see which exposures we can instrument from this. So we found instruments for smoking, high blood pressure, cholesterol. We didn't include lipoprotein A because it's a pretty monogenic exposure. We also included physical activity, diabetes, diabetes and obesity. And here's a quick dive into the results you see here on the left, posterior probabilities. So we have strong evidence if we are close to one and no evidence if it's close to none. And on the right hand side, you see the effect estimates. So the novelty of this approach is that you see the evidence for all diseases at the same time. This is here shown on the x-axis. You have here all of the five CVD outcomes. So previously, we were only able to retrieve like one column in the puzzle. But now this type of new formulation of um, the output of the model allows you to also see, for example, apolipoprotein B may be a causal risk factor for three of the diseases at the same time. Similarly, black like blood pressure, uh, so genetically predicted levels of blood pressure associated with all of the five CVD outcomes. And also the neat thing is we can see here the effect sizes. So you see here, for example, upper lipoprotein B and blood pressure have the strongest effect on coronary artery disease on cut and weaker for the other CVD outcomes. While, for example, type 2 diabetes has the strongest impact on PAT and weaker on others. We can also look at the residual correlation. So basically, what is the correlation between the genetic associations and the outcome that cannot be explained by the exposures? And when we showed this to our collaborators, they were extremely excited. They said, yes, we know that heart failure is a consequence of cut, and cardioembolic stroke is a uh, consequence of atrial fibrillation. So this here is just a correlation network. There are no errors going in and out. But yet at the same time, we were wondering what can we do more? And this motivated the development of MRDAC, where we are actually able to model the causal relationship between outcomes and between exposures to improve the estimation of exposure to outcome. 
And here the current gap in the MR toolbox is that the standard one exposure versus one outcome MR model cannot reflect complex causal paths between multiple out phenotypes. And this may induce bias to dupliotropy, which distorts conclusions and produces spurious findings that are too often claimed as causal in applied analysis. And the new model MRDAC is essentially a causal discovery algorithm for directed acyclic graphs or DACs. And it combines three causal inference strategies. First, we use genetic variations as instrumental variables in the MR framework. Then it implements a Bayesian causal discovery algorithm based on Gaussian graphical models to learn the DACs. And then we use interventional calculus according to Perl to derive the causal effect estimates. The application example that we decided to work on looks at the effect of lifestyle and behavioral exposures on mental health. And we know that there are quite complex and sometimes also reciprocal relationship between lifestyle and behavioral exposures and also between the mental health traits. Our aim is to model the network between the exposures, between the outcomes, to improve the effect estimation from exposure to outcome. And what you see from this figure here is we have smoking and education as the key points of interventions in the network on the exposure side and um, depression as the key point in the outcome side. So here in this graph, again, you see here posterior probabilities, here effect sizes. Um, this here is a so-called block matrix where we have on the top left the effect among the outcomes. Here's the effect of exposure on outcomes and here among the exposures. We rule out reverse causation. So the exposure, so the, so the outcomes may not be caused by the exposures. As said, we have here education as one of the key factors that has effects on ADHD, on autism, and on bipolar disorder. And as a positive control, it increases also cognition. Similarly, smoking has an effect on depression, ADHD to a weaker degree to bipolar disorder and schizophrenia and also in, on cognition. And coming to the effect on schizophrenia in a second, as said, with respect to depression, we see here strong effects among the other um, outcomes, and especially liability to depression seems to increase the risk for uh, bipolar disorder and schizophrenia. So you can see here this pathway from depression to bipolar disease to schizophrenia. So we know that many uh, schizophrenic patients actually smoke, and we see here the impact of smoking may be mediated via genetic liability to depression, to bipolar disorder. And indeed, once we remove uh, bipolar, dis uh, once we remove depression, we see the effect of smoking on schizophrenia. So one potential explanation for this could be that the initial GVAS for, de de uh, for depression was, had a very wide case definition. So this may be um, due to uh, overlap in diagnosis and also overlap in symptoms, where depression is known to have the most common uh, symptoms across all mental health disorders. Now, coming to the conclusion um, on what we can do to address the credibility crisis in MR, so the first important point is to try to answer relevant research questions and also to address the IV assumptions in the MR framework. The other important aspect is to use plausible proxies for meaningful intervention. I think here one particular exciting aspect is drug target MR. The other aspect is you need to be really aware of the input data, especially when we work on two sample MR where we recycle and reuse existing GVASs. We need to know how this data were generated and what may be potential biases in here. And overall, MR and genetic evidence is only one piece of the puzzle. So it's really important to think about triangulation of evidence. So can we find other data sources, other analytical approaches with different assumptions and different biases? And can we use and combine them to draw our conclusions? Future directions. So for one, this is also a call for better methods. All methods I presented here are developed on two sample MR, so summary level data. I think now with the availability of large-scale cohorts and biobanks, we really need more and better MR methods for individual data. 
And as I hopefully have shown you, we can also combine statistical learning and causal inference strategies to draw a better picture of our complex reality. And as said, we also need more data. So I think there's a particular opportunity in large scale biobanks and cohort studies that link the genome to deep and in particular important accurate phenotyping as well. And I'm also extremely excited about efforts to increase genomic equity and to embrace genetic diversity. And then I'm very much looking forward to uh, molecular phenotyping and single cell resolution, which will be covered in the third talk of the session. Um, this work is very multidisciplinary. Um, a special thanks to all of my collaborators, also to Professor Mike Johnson, who is here today, to my funders, and thanks so much for the invitation. All software is out on GitHub. Here's the link to the publications, and I'm trying to put out small tutorials on all of the work. So thank you very much. Um, yeah. Happy to take questions. Thank you very much, uh, Verena, for an excellent introduction to this topic, pointing out the extreme challenges and complexity in, I think, doing this subject well. So uh, we should have time for a couple of questions. Yes? Thank you, very nice summary. I was just wondering when you claim you can do drug target MR, what is kind of the efforts to really benchmark this? So how many drug targets do you recover and which data entities are best for it? <laughs> <laughs> I think I'm actually going to bounce this question to the second talk, <laughs> but I think it's like a very exciting aspect. And there have been some efforts to kind of especially the group of Sultan Kutalik has been trying to see what is the best type of strategy to do. Do we just take the nearest gene? Do we look into whole exome sequencing? Do we run MR combined with co-localization? I think there's still lots of open questions uh, around this topic, but I think everything is connected. Are we using the right data sets? And do we have the right tissue? Do we have the right way of measuring our molecular features? And I think Mike is going to go into this topic a bit in the third talk of the session. Okay, a quick question from me. I share your concern about phenotype. Do you think existing um, large databases are sufficiently good, or should we be designing better ones mm, yes. uh, from scratch? Yes, I think this. This is an excellent question, and we had issues with the depression, as I mentioned, like we were taking existing data from the Psychiatric Genet Genetics Consortium, and they had a very broad definition of what depression is. Yeah. So we saw this kind of as the index condition, it kind of was capturing all broad range of psychiatric diseases as depression, also it was just a starting point for more specific conditions. So I think there's lots of potential there, and as I said, we see lots of biases because we have inaccurate and weak phenotyping. Sometimes we just try to increase power by having more samples at the cost of a very weak phenotyping. Yes. Okay. Any further questions? If not, thank you again. So, our second speaker this afternoon is uh, based at UCL, uh, that is uh, Professor Harun Hing Hingarani, and he, Harun is going to talk about Mendelian randomization and drug development, as already mentioned in Verena's talk. Thank you very much, and thank you to the organisers for inviting me. Um, I feel slightly ectopic because I'm going to talk about using genomics to develop impersonal rather than personalised medicines, but uh, hopefully it will be of interest. And I'd like to thank uh, Verena for her earlier talk because she saved me quite a bit of work in terms of explaining Mendelian randomization analysis. Um, so going back to 2001 with the first report of the first draft of the sequence of the human genome, um, the authors of the, uh, the consortium authors said in their discussion that knowing the complete set of human genes and proteins will greatly expand the search for suitable drug targets. And the principle that they were espousing there was that 
Um, the human proteome, the proteins produced in the body that are still the major category of drug targets, are encoded in the genome. So if we know all our genes, we know all the potential proteins that are encoded and therefore all the drug targets. And so we should be able to develop new drugs more efficiently. Uh, alongside that, they talked about uses of human genomic variation and how variants in the genome that encode proteins that affect drug handling and drug action might be used to predict response to drugs, the area of pharmacogenetics and stratified medicine, and also uh, might be used to better predict disease. We heard a little bit about disease prediction uh, earlier on today. But I'm going to focus on the drug development aspects. So I'll start by saying that one of the key tasks in drug developments is to develop compounds, whatever those chemical entities may be, that target proteins that you think would be useful drug targets. And those proteins are encoded in the genome. You might call that the compound target matching problem. And there is a whole area of, of, of science that's around um, developing compounds, whether they be small molecules or large molecules, um, that are optimized for targeting proteins. And um, just thinking about the available drug targets in the context of the number of known human genes, back in um, 2002, Hopkins and Groom introduced this concept of the druggable genome, that is the set of human genes that encode proteins that could be or are drug targets. They suggested that there, at that time, there might be around 3,000 of the around 20,000 um, um, uh, protein coding genes that might encode drug targets. And at that time, the estimates were that about 483 of those targets were already exploited as the targets of licensed drugs. And, and estimates of the druggable genome have evolved over time, and the number of targets that we exploit um, clinically has also grown but is still well short of the potential number of drug targets that could be exploited. So the second problem in drug development is not simply to know all the proteins that might be targeted by drugs, but to actually know which proteins are important for which diseases. And that's the target disease matching problem. So it's a big problem. Um, I wanted to try and illustrate this by this sample space. Imagine, if you will, um, that there are around 10,000 diseases. Um, we can argue about the precise number, but let's take that as red for now. We know that there are about 20,000 protein coding genes in the genome. Now, of course, the number of proteins and macromolecules that exist in the body are many more because genes are alternatively spliced, subunits come together to make bigger proteins, but let's take as red that there are 20,000 proteins. So if that's the case, then we have 200 million protein disease pairs. So if we think of diseases as columns and genes and proteins as rows, for any given disease shown as a column here, we're trying to identify the causal genes. And one way of doing that is through genome-wide association studies. Now let's imagine there are 100 causal genes for any given disease. Then among the sample space as a whole, there would be a million causal disease protein pairings out of the 200 million in total. So the probability of detecting a causal disease pair at random, imagine if you just put your hand into the sample space and pulled out a blob, would be one in 200. Now, of course, we don't pull out blobs at random. We do experiments to try and prioritize which proteins to work on in drug development. But one argument is that if we do experiments um, with 80% power, in other words, 80% probability of detecting a true effect, but we accept a 5% false, false positive rate, in other words, negative um, proteins, we would we'd accept a false positive rate of 5%, then our false discovery rate is about 93% in that context. And that's very high. But actually, it's very close to the empirical estimates of the rates of drug development failure. And in fact, the failure rates are very high even in clinical phase testing. And the major reasons for failure in clinical phase testing are listed here. Lack of efficacy, safety concerns, possibly mechanism-based adverse effects, 
So major reasons for failure in drug development are that the drugs that we've developed against a particular target that we'd anticipated would work for a particular disease simply don't. And we've got the hypothesis wrong about that protein target being important in that disease. So why are these rates so high, or why have they been so high? Well, they, re they have relied traditionally on preclinical testing in cells, tissues, and animal models. But that doesn't model the whole organism. And nor do animal models well model human disease. And if you study humans using an observational design, um, for the reasons that um, Verena mentioned, you can um, be misled by confounding and reverse causation. So when you take a target disease hypothesis forward into clinical testing, you might have a, a very high failure rate. And the problem is that the definitive experiment, the randomized control trial, is the last thing you do in drug development. So um, a further problem is that you can only study a few targets at a time. So you can't work through this sample space very rapidly. So this is where genomics may, may play a part. Um, so I'm going to talk about genomics for identification of target disease indication pairs and the role of genome-wide association studies. So these studies study the right organism. You test all targets concurrently because you're looking at variation throughout the genome, throughout every gene. Um, we design them such that the false discovery rate is low, and we tend to replicate findings before declaring them as positive. And as Verena mentioned, they emulate the randomized control trial because genetic variants are allocated at random. So genetic studies could be used to anticipate the effects of drugs acting on the proteins that are discovered by such studies. So I'm showing you again the sample space. This time I've just taken a region out of it of 100 diseases and 200 genes, but I've said this time there are 1,000 causal genes per disease. So when you do a GWAS, you take one disease, you try and identify hits, but not only are you interested in hits that encode proteins that are causal, but also those that are druggable, that druggable set of genome, uh, the druggable genome I mentioned, the horizontal blue lines there. So if you find a target that's both causal and druggable, that's one that you think possibly that you should pursue in drug development for that disease. So when we looked back at genome-wide association studies that had been published up to about 2017 or so, what you find is, and this partly addresses the question that Mike raised earlier, is that there are many rediscoveries of known drug targets in genome-wide association studies. In other words, you rediscover the targets of drugs that were developed for other reasons, um, but which target proteins that are encoded by genes that are uh, unearthed as hits in genome-wide association studies. And there are examples shown here across a number of different diseases. Now, there are nevertheless problems in target identification because when you identify a region in the genome where there are variants associated with disease, it's often hard to go from the variant to the genes. So you can have regions where associations span multiple genes. And so there's a whole science emerging of gene prioritization that relies on a number of different methods, which I won't go through in detail here. There are, there are, I've shown many on the slide, but there are also many more I'm sure I've missed out. Um, but as um, was mentioned earlier, when you go through systematically these methods, when you have a gold standard set of gene targets that you think you know about with a high degree of confidence, the feature that seems to emerge as the most important one is proximity to the lead variant. So based on this, it's now becoming possible to take information from genetic association studies, common or rare variation, and try and use that information to identify the relevant proteins, to see if they're drug targets, and to go further and to see whether there are already molecules that target those proteins, perhaps even licensed drugs, um, which might um, uh, unveil indication expansion or even repurposing opportunities. And there are efforts to do this very systematically. Open targets is, is a well-known one. So I'm going to say something now about genomics and target validation. And this is where Mendelian randomization comes in. So the principle here is that you use variants within a gene encoding a drug target that influence the expression or activity of the encoded protein. And you use those to anticipate the effect of a drug that's targeting the same protein. Now, the genetic variants are allocated at random. That helps with confounding. 
They can't be changed by disease. That helps with reverse causation. And you can consider drug target Mendelian randomization analyses as natural randomized trials. And the parallels between a randomized trial and Mendelian randomization analyses uh, in the drug target setting were, were shown before. So here's a worked example of this. This is comparing the effect of taking a statin on metabolites measured in the blood, so changes in those metabolites before and after taking a statin, with the effects of variants in a gene that encode the, targets for stat uh, the target for statin drugs, HMG-CoA reductase. So we know from previous studies that um, statins reduce LDL cholesterol from trials, that they lower LDL cholesterol and heart disease risk, that's corroborated by genetic findings. And going further, we can see that variants in the gene encoding the statin target reproduce the effects of statin treatment on a very vast range of metabolites. And you can do a thought experiment here that if you hadn't invented statins, the genetics is giving you a readout of their likely effects. So um, you can also extend this to look at the validity of a target not just for one disease outcome, but for many, because Genome-wide association studies are being done for many diseases, and not infrequently, the same gene and target comes up for multiple diseases. And this has been, come to be known as phenome-wide association analysis. Here's an example. Um, the interleukin-6 receptor um, um, gene came up as a hit in a GWAS of rheumatoid arthritis. That's a target for the drug tocilizumab, which is already licensed for the treatment of rheumatoid arthritis. Um, but in other GWASs, the same um, gene has come up as a hit for coronary heart disease, atrial fibrillation, abdominal aortic aneurysm. So are there opportunities to expand the indication of interleukin-6 receptor blockade for these conditions? And are there safety concerns, or could there be safety concerns? There appears to be an increased risk of asthma with the same genetic variant. So using this principle, a number of um, um, applications have been made of drug target Mendelian randomization, and I've listed some of them here. But the kind of questions or applications that have been um, undertaken, including prioritizing drug target indication pairs prior to clinical phase testing, separating on from off target effects of drugs, trying to predict success or failure in clinical trials, repurposing and expansion, and even modeling the effects of drugs given in combination through a technique called factorial Mendelian randomization. And I've shown you the examples of trying to identify biomarkers of um, therapeutic action, which might be used to help optimize lead compounds in drug development. So um, the challenges when, with Mendelian randomization have been mentioned before, um, but what I want to consider here is why drug target Mendelian randomization, as was alluded to earlier, has some special properties that protect it to some extent from some of the challenges that affect other types of MR analysis. So in a, in a drug target Mendelian randomization, the exposure of interest um, is not a behavior, it's a drug target. The exposure, often a protein, is a proximal gene product. The genetic instruments of choice are not across the whole genome. They're the variants that are within or around the gene encoding the drug target. And the exposure could be the measured level of the protein itself or its function of the mRNA transcript or of some downstream biomarker that you can confidently assign to an effect of that protein. And in these ways, drug target MR adheres more closely to the assumptions of Mendelian randomization than other types of MR analysis. So just trying to sort of present that pictorially, genetic vari we know from um, the central dogma of molecular biology that DNA makes RNA makes protein. There's a unidirectional flow of information in this zone of the Crick central dogma. Beyond that, the direction of effects become a bit more fuzzy. But any, any of these measurements that I've shown here beyond DNA could be regarded as, as exposures in Mendelian randomization analysis. But only proteins, only messenger RNA, and only DNA now are targets or potential targets of, of drug therapies or most drug therapies. And when you're considering, for example, a protein, for example, C-reactive protein in this example is a potential drug target. Those sorts of MR analyses are relatively protected from horizontal pleiotropy 
because there are very few pathways proximal to the protein by which a genetic variant could influence the disease independent of the exposure of interest. Whereas an exposure like blood pressure, which we would envisage as being more distal, there are many more possibilities for horizontal pleiotropy. Moreover, where you have a protein, there's a natural choice of genetic instruments arising from the gene of interest uh, that encodes that protein, variants acting in cis, whereas, as was mentioned earlier, there's no cis versus trans distinction for, for exposures that are further downstream. Genome-wide approaches tend to be taken. So this is just another, another illustration. I won't go through it in detail. I think the point's been made about the importance of using variants in the gene encoding the drug target as instruments. Now, the options and possibilities, the toolbox for Mendelian randomization analysis is expanding because it's now also possible to measure proteins at scale in a way that wasn't previously undertaken in a single blood sample. So here's one example of, of um, the identification of genetic variants that could be used as instruments for, for proteins that might be drug targets from genome-wide association analysis. And this is work done by Mike Pietzner, Claudia Langenberg, and, and, and colleagues, and published here. And you can see the, the um, diagonal pink line are the location of cis variants in the genome that could be potential instruments. So here's CRP again. Here's a genome-wide association study of, G, of CRP. There are variants that affect CRP level outside of the CRP gene or inside the CRP gene. It's preferable to use the variants inside the CRP gene if you're trying to uh, validate it as a drug target. Why? Shown here, variants, a variant on the left in cis affects C-reactive protein concentration, but not a range of many other biomarkers. If you were to choose a SNP outside of the CRP gene that affects CRP level, in this case a SNP in APOE, there's the potential to affect not just CRP, but many other factors that might have direct routes to coronary heart disease, for example, as a disease outcome, independent of CRP. It's also important in drug target Mendelian randomization to frame your question carefully. If you're interested in whether HDL cholesterol is an important risk factor or biomarker for coronary heart disease that you might choose to lower in some way, that's not a drug target Mendelian randomization question. It's a biomarker Mendelian randomization question. There are no natural cis variants for HDL cholesterol. HDL cholesterol is polygenic. You would need to use variants throughout the genome. But if your interest is in does a particular drug target, in this case cholesterol ester transfer protein, which can affect HDL cholesterol, is that a useful drug target, then that's a cis Mendelian randomization question. And you use variants in the gene encoding CTP. Now, the exposure that you use could be the measurement of CTP itself, if you have that facility, but you could employ HDL cholesterol, which is known to be affected by, by CTP, as a downstream biomarker exposure. But it's important to remember the inference in that analysis is not on HDL cholesterol, because you're using cis instruments, the inference is on CTP. So here are an example of those side by side. Biomarker MR analysis, genome-wide on HDL cholesterol, a kind of equivocal result for coronary disease, a drug target MR result um, weighted by HDL cholesterol um, suggests a protective effect of CTP blockade, and that's been um, shown to be the case in a clinical trial of a CTP inhibitor. And that's also borne out when you use, instead of HDL cholesterol the as a biomarker for CTP, CTP itself, the protein measurement. And then here, um, you can see that um, blockade of CTP might be predicted to be protective not only for heart disease, but also for chronic kidney disease, possibly heart failure too, but potentially could increase the risk of age-related macular disease, so a, a safety signal. It's also important not to over uh, make strong inferences about the mediator of the effect. So some people have said, well, the genetic effect on CTP is because CTP lowers LDL cholesterol and ApoB, which is indeed the case. Um, but CTP also affects HDL cholesterol, triglycerides, and many other biomarkers. And indeed, there are other genes that contain variants that have similar patterns of effect on HDL cholesterol, on a coronary artery, on, on triglycerides, and on coronary artery disease, but have absolutely no effect on LDL cholesterol. So be careful, I think, not to over-infer the downstream mediators from a drug target MR. 
OK, so going broadly to close now, what are the prospects for using genetic analysis um, to improve success rates uh, in drug development? Well, there are theoretical calculations that have looked into this. And then there are empirical studies, albeit retrospective, in which people have asked the question, um, what's the probability of um, approval given prior genetic support for a drug? And they've, um, they've inferred this retrospectively, looking at pre-existing drug approvals and retrospectively whether or not there was genetic evidence around those drugs. And various estimates have been made of the fold increase in drug development success rates, depending on the approach used and the data set used. Um, whatever you think about this, the pharmaceutical industry is investing massively in this approach and actually in the population data sets that contain the genetic and other omics information that's needed because these data don't lie in industry. They lie in academia and the public sector and they employ publicly funded research and health record data as well because many such studies have disease outcome from health record linkage. And I think that poses a question for how we should think about the economic model of drug development because the public sector is making an increasing contribution through these data sets, through the identification and validation of drug targets, which may well de-risk drug development, but the drugs that are produced may still be very expensive unless some recognition is given to the contribution made to the value chain by the public sector investment at the outset. And I think even that the public sector, if these data are used, um, could set up a contractual arrangements such that if drugs are developed, there is a revenue stream back into the public sector, some recognition in terms of pricing and availability, and may even uh, be able to stake some claim into which diseases are prioritized um, for drug development. So a different model of uh, economic model of, of drug development. So I'll conclude by saying the high failure rates in drug development fuel drug price inflation and actually risk-averse R&D. So we have few drugs for many diseases. Um, there's a case for using human genomics as part of the many data uh, inputs that go into determining what drug development programs you prioritize. Um, but there's an opportunity to maximize the scale by even larger studies um, of the type that we've heard about earlier today, such as our future health. Um, but I think it's achieving this in a fair way for society and to reduce the possibility that we don't have a glut of highly expensive drugs that healthcare systems can't afford, I think needs wider discussion and engagement regarding the economic model and perhaps could even lead to a more needs-led rather than a profit-led approach to drug development. So I'd like to conclude by thanking the many people who've contributed to this work. There are more than those um, shown or, or listed here. Um, and I'd like to obviously thank all the funders for the work who are on the uh, opening slide. Thank you. Thank you very much, Arun, for a very interesting talk, including uh, some rather provocative questions at the end. So, any questions from the audience? Yes. Thanks so much for that um, fantastic talk. I was really struck by your comments at the end about a uh, model that would enable sort of uh, more equitable, potentially uh, benefit sharing from data, because that's a big concern, I think, with underrepresented populations and a big concern of mine. If we try to bring people on board in an honest and transparent way, knowing all this data will be used for drug discovery as well as optimization. So what do you think is the role we can play and how can we be active in promoting this in the policy space so that we can be proactive for this concern that you've so well highlighted. Yes, it's a very important point you raise. And I think one thing that we can do is bring the relevant stakeholders together and debate this, because I think it's not a point that's really being debated very well. And I think we actually have agency to do that. We, we have the ability through our networks and connections and so on to bring the various communities together to discuss this. So I think that is something we could take forward. 
So one question from me. Do you think so far in genomics, since we've had the uh, human genome sequence and things like GWAS, has genomics really reached its full potential yet in drug discovery, or is that something that is going to happen in the next 10 years? Thanks, that's a, that's a question. Have we saturated the findings? Um, so this is a point that was dealt with by Matt Nelson in his latest Nature paper, uh, looking at um, the fold increase in drug development success, albeit retrospectively, the conclusions that they draw in their paper, and they have some calculations to support it, that we have not yet saturated the system. We are still discovering new loci with larger and larger data sets. And you, know, you think about a data set like our future health, five million people, linkage to health records. There are many more diseases that haven't been studied, for example, by GWAS, certainly at scale, for which we might discover new targets. And certainly those are diseases that are not well treated, many of them. So I think uh, there, are, there are more opportunities. Okay, one final question from Perma. Thanks, Sir, uh, great talk. Can I just um, ask you about numbers of druggable genome? You know, 20,000 genes, okay. maybe 25% yeah. are druggable. Yeah. Um, do you think that's an underestimate? Because I th probably, I think it is an underestimate. It's based on the technologies we know about at the moment and the function of the proteins, but actually it'll be more than 25% of the gen uh, genome that's druggable. Yeah, exactly so. As you can see, the estimates have been increasing, and they're largely based on thinking of exclusively as prote of proteins as drug targets. But if a protein's not druggable, you might take an RNA interference approach, and you've always got CRISPR-Cas9 if you can you know, deliver um, um, the CRISPR-Cas9 to, to the right tissue. So there was, a, there was an editorial in, in um, Nature Genetics, I think, four or five years ago, saying it's all druggable now. You know? <laughs> it's just what's the modality? Yeah. OK. Thank you very much, you. Arun. And <laughs> right, we now need to move on to the final speaker in this session, um, who once again comes from Imperial. And this time, we've got Michael Johnson, who's going to talk about single cell Mendelian randomization for target and causal biomarker discovery. Thank you very much. Um, so, uh, yes, and thank you, uh, Minir, for the kind invitation. Um, I'm a, a clinical neurologist and uh, professor of genomic medicine at Imperial College. Um, so, the motivation behind our research uh, has been uh, outlined very nicely by Arun uh, just now, but essentially it's because uh, drug development is inefficient and expensive. So only 5% of new molecular entities that pass preclinical validation are ultimately clinically approved. Half of these fail in phase one, approximately, uh, due to toxicity. But surprisingly, half, uh, approximately half will fail in phase two or phase three due to lack of efficacy from inadequate target validation in early drug discovery. Um, and these failure rates are even worse for central nervous system drugs. Um, so, for example, in the period 2010 to 2020, over 200 investigational programs in Alzheimer's disease were abandoned. And so this low probability of success in drug development makes drugs very expensive to develop, as we know. And all of this wasted time, effort, money, and opportunity, I think, make poor target validation a public health issue. So, um, as Arun mentioned, uh, Matt Nelson, uh, working at GSK, published in 2015 uh, this seminal uh, work that showed that the odds of approval of a particular target indication pairing uh, were, were um, substantially increased if there was genetic data to support the um, link between that particular target and the disease indication. Uh, and importantly, the probability of success improves with increasing confidence in that target indication pairing. So with GWAS data, for example, if there's genetic evidence supporting the target indication pair, then you're approximately two times more likely to be clinically approved. Uh, but if there's Mendelian genetics data supporting that target indication pairing, then you're up to eight times more likely to be approved. And the reason that GWAS data is poor or relatively poor at predicting um, the success of a target indication pair is because most GWAS loci fall into non-coding region. And that means the causal gene is often not known or worse. It's um, uh, erroneously inferred. Um, 
The directionality of the effect of that gene on disease risk isn't known, uh, and nor are the cell types in which genes act to cause disease known. So um, in uh, uh, a couple of months ago, uh, Matt Nelson updated this work from 2015, and the main take-home message for me was that looking at complex disease, the chance of clinical success of a target indication pair was found to be independent of the genetic effect size and the allele frequency. And a good example of that are the population health benefits of statins compared to the relatively tiny effects of genetic variation in the HMG-CoA reductase. They also postulated that the relative success for targets supported by genetic evidence would be greater for disease-modifying targets. And this is something uh, that we very much agree with. And of course, it's still the case that for brain disease, most drugs are symptomatic treatments, not disease-modifying. So intuitively, as well, and now supported by data, um, we, we think that information on the mediating cell type for a particular therapeutic will enhance the chances of success of a clinical development program. And that's really by ensuring that we do the appropriate preclinical and clinical work um, to, to make sure that we've got appropriate tissue and cell biodistribution before going into clinical phase trials. Um, and then finally, another, the last piece of work that really influenced our most more recent approach to target and biomarker discovery was published in Nature Genetics in 2020, where they showed that target indication pairs supported by both co-localization and Mendelian randomization, and I'll talk more about these in a moment, are up to 10 times more likely to be approved. So um, as Verena mentioned, what we're trying to do with uh, molecular QTL-based causal inference is to connect the relative change in um, the level of an exposure, such as the change in expression of a gene in a particular cell type, with a particular disease outcome. So a typical way of doing this over the last several decades has been, been to conduct differential gene expression analysis. And we might find, for example, that gene X expression is increased in microglia uh, in uh, Alzheimer's disease brains compared to control brains. And one might conclude uh, that perhaps that gene has a causal role in Alzheimer's or the pathway that it encodes has a causal role with the disease. But again, as Verena mentioned, there might be confounders. In this case, we might have age as a confounder, for example, and with increasing age, we get increasing expression of gene X in microglia, but of course, age is also a major risk factor for the development of Alzheimer's. And then there would be no causal association between the exposure and the disease. Um, in, we might also have a reverse causal situation where the disease itself causes the change in expression of gene X in microglia. So um, as we've heard, Mendelian randomization is a statistical and methodological framework for inferring potential causal relationships between change in the levels of exposures and disease outcomes. And uh, from a genomics uh, perspective, uh, when we think about uh, genetically anchored um, uh, Mendelian randomization, we think of genetic variants that influence the expression of a gene exposure as uh, expression quantitative trait loci, or EQTLs. And uh, a genetic variant for which we've identified, sorry, for a, a gene um, exposure for which we've identified one or more regulatory variants, we term e-genes. So in a situation where we have a genetic variant or instrumental variable that uh, regulates the expression of a gene, perhaps in a particular cell type, and that same genetic variant also confers risk for the disease, then in the absence of confounding and under a strict set of assumptions, that relationship, which is measured by the MR regression, can be taken as evidence for a causal relationship or causal association between the exposure and the outcome. And as we heard, these MR assumptions are absolutely critical to the design and the interpretation of MR studies. So the relevance assumption, just to recap on this, is that the genetic variant G is truly associated with the exposure. And for molecular QTL work, that's relatively easy to address uh, through the use of careful QTL statistical approaches. Um, the independence assumption, again, as Verena mentioned, uh, assumes that there is no causal link between the genetic uh, 
uh, variant and the unobserved confounders. This is harder to test, not least because many of these confounders are unobserved. And then we have uh, the problem of uh, pleiotropy. So the exclusion restriction assumption assumes that the genetic variant is acting via your measured exposure, and that's the only route by which um, the exposure can have or the variant can have an effect on the outcome. But we might have, for example, uh, a situation where that genetic variant does instrument the exposure X, but it also directly instruments another gene A, and actually the causal pathway is via gene A, not via, via gene X. And in that situation, we would still observe a change in the level of that exposure X in association with the disease outcome, but actually it would have nothing to do with disease causation because the causation is via another route which is co-regulated via the same genetic variant. Alternatively, we might have a genetic variant here which is in, is in linkage to equilibrium with another genetic variant, and it's that genetic variant that instruments um, exposure A. And this is known as uh, um, horizontal pleiotropy. And this is a particular problem for single cell gene expression data because of the sparsity of the data, meaning that we don't have accurate instrumental variables for all of our gene exposures and all of the cell types. So there's a lot of unknown um, information. However, when um, MR is conducted uh, correctly and rigorously, it can provide incredibly useful information. So because this exposure lies on the path to co disease causation, then it represents a drug target for disease modification. And that can provide um, drug developers with the confidence that's required to proceed with drug development. But also because this exposure lies on the causal path to the outcome, then a change in the level of this exposure as a consequence, as a, as a consequence of a therapeutic intervention can act as a biomarker that is predictive of that therapeutic intervention. And this means we can design faster and cheaper clinical trials where potentially you could use this as an intermediate or surrogate marker for um, a clinical effect with clinical trials um, uh, measuring um, predictive effect and also target engagement conducted over days or weeks rather than the years it takes to run a clinical trial in some long-term brain disorders like dementia. Um, but also these biomarkers can offer accelerated pathways for regulatory approval, which of course is very attractive to pharma. So um, in uh, 2018, it turns out that actually 73% of all FDA approvals were on the basis of these accelerated approvals um, using intermediate predictive uh, biomarkers. Uh, and this accelerated approval pathway was created by the FDA in 1992 to hasten approval of drugs that treat serious conditions. And incredibly, it turns out these biomarkers are only required to be reasonably likely to predict clinical benefit. So in exchange for the accelerated approval, manufacturers are required to run confirmatory studies to show the clinical benefits once the drug is on the market. And the FDA do have authority to remove that drug licensing um, if they fail to show clinical benefit. But a, a recent retrospective review of drugs licensed on these surrogate endpoints showed that the benefits of, were only demonstrated, clinical benefits were only demonstrated in 19 out of 93 approved submissions. So we know that drug payers would surely um, benefit from more strongly validated predictive markers. Um, but also, as I mentioned, for neurodegenerative diseases in particular, we need biomarkers that are predictive of clinical benefit, um, given the expense and duration uh, required to measure long-term, um, to do, conduct clinical trials in, in long-term um, uh, uh, neurological disorders. So um, as background to the work that we do, we work um, at the moment primarily with single-cell RNA sequencing data uh, and what we do um, in the brain, and we use post-mortem brain tissue. So Imperial College hosts the uh, UK multiple sclerosis and Parkinson's disease uh, brain banks, and we also try to collect control brains. Um, but so what we'll do is take a bit of the cortex here, the temporal cortex, um, uh, from a post-mortem donor, uh, and then we homogenize that cortex into its single cell constituents. Then we'll use um, some platform or other to assay the gene expression in each of these individual cells uh, using single cell RNA sequencing, and then through a series of computational post-hoc analyses, we can profile gene expression in individual cell types. And this sort of data 
then allows us to calculate EQTLs in individual cell types. So EQTL discovery is based typically on a linear model where we test the additive effect of genotype at a SNP on gene expression whilst uh, accounting for clinical covariates and, um, and random effects such as population structure. And this beta regression coefficient uh, gives us an indication of both the size of the effect of genotype on gene expression and also the directionality of the relationship. So with single cell data, we can make these EQTL calculations at a level of single cell types. So for example, here this uh, allele small a would be associated, or here is associated with an increase in the expression of this gene in astrocytes. But that same allele here, a, small a, has no effect on the expression of that gene in pyramidal neurons. So this is an example of cell type specific genetic regulation of gene expression. And it turns out that around 20 to 30% of genes in the brain are under this type of cell type specific genetic regulation. So from a practical point of view, what we do is we take the single cell gene expression matrix, we, compare, we combine that with the matched genotype matrix um, across hundreds or thousands of individuals, and that then allows us to map the um, association of individual SNPs across the genome with the expression of individual genes in individual cell types. So here this represents the lead SNP associated with the expression of gene X 